computer. All right, so we are recording. I wanna um, thank everybody for showing up today and I really wanna thank our guest speaker um, who is Stace Maples. And Stace and I met, oh gosh, I don't know how many years ago, in a, oh. yeah, in a workshop um, and we were the bad kids at the back of the room um, that were really pushing the, the envelope and um, doing some fun things. But um, I invited him in to talk today and gave him some free reign on what he could talk about. And I'm actually gonna turn off my video and mute myself and, um, and let him roll. Um, so Stace, right. if, uh, I'll ask questions um, that come up in the chat. Um, so I have that open and, and so they'll, they'll do that. And then, um, and if you wanna go ahead and take over the screen whenever right. you do, and I'll let you kind of introduce your background. See if I can figure this out here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let me just start with, um, yeah, with my background and introduction. So, hi, I'm I'm Stace Maples. I run the Stanford Geospatial Center uh, here at Stanford University. Well, not here because right now I'm in my bedroom. But uh, mm -hmm. um, I've been doing geospatial stuff for about um, 20 years now for research and teaching. Uh, in a university setting, I began working with uh, geographic information systems and spatial data and spatial technologies uh, when I was doing archaeology at Southern Methodist University. I began uh, managing a, uh, a large archaeological survey. We had about 250 archaeological sites on an 8,000 acre ranch, and I was trying to manage all of this data on paper which was a nightmare, um, especially since I wanted to do things like logistic regression analysis on site location and things like that. Um, and so I started looking around for ways to do what I was doing on paper on USGS topo maps, like trying to get the slope and aspect and soil types from USDA maps and things like that. Um, I discovered GIS because I knew there must be at that time a way to do it with a computer. Um, we didn't have Google Maps. Uh, I think MapQuest might have just been in its infancy. So there weren't a whole lot of examples of people doing mapping with computers at the time that were in the, in the sort of uh, um, general view. But I was doing graphics for computer, uh, um, for web pages already at that point. It was about 96. And so I started looking around for a way to map with computers. And that's when I discovered geographic information systems. And um, I'd spent about six months trying to digitize all of my site data from my archaeological sites and um, try to get it into a, a format so that I could um, do a logistic regression analysis without a GIS. This was just doing, you know, uh, uh, extracting lat long coordinates and then uh, associating soil types and things like that with them in a table. And, and that I'd spent six months doing that. It was a nightmare. I was trying to blow up acetates with USDA soil maps and things like that on them. And then I discovered GIS and uh, it took me about a month of weekends to digitize all of my data. And then it took five minutes to do a logistic regression analysis. Um, probably another 15 minutes on, you know, 1996 computers to output probability rasters uh, for site locations based on subsistence strategy. And I was sold at that point. Um, you know, when, when you could, when you could do those types of analyses at that, at that time in the nineties with, um, that kind of speed, um, and that kind of ease, I decided that right then that the way to not only manage and analyze archeological data was with geographic information systems, but that it should be captured that way straight to digital. And so I started working, uh, most of my early work was on digital uh, field data collection techniques. Um, and uh, then I ended up with a, a degree, a graduate degree in remote sensing and geographic information sciences from UT Dallas. Um, spent about 10 years after my graduate work at UT Dallas um, at Yale, doing what I do at Stanford, supporting the use of GIS and remote sensing and spatial data technologies uh, for research and teaching. At Yale, a lot of what I did was digital humanities work, uh, um, stuff for historians, um, political scientists, uh, a lot of work with the forestry department at Yale, 
which is very storied, um, running uh, things like their tree survey, um, uh, mapping and surveying on a rolling basis, 40,000 street trees in the city of New Haven, um, those kinds of projects at Yale. And about five years ago, I came to Stanford and at Stanford, I mostly focus on public health projects. Um, I run the Stanford Geospatial Center, so I manage the events and the staff and, uh, and our uh, support program there. We, we have a support program where we teach workshops um, similar to, uh, to this on a, on a regular basis, um, uh, every Friday, in fact. Um, and we'll start that up next Friday. We'll start teaching our workshops. We also do direct consulting, provide infrastructure like geocoding infrastructure and access to uh, computing resources, software, data, and so on. Um, so that's me. That's what I do. Um, currently, my big project that I work on is a project to implement machine learning on um, satellite remote sensing data, um, specifically in an area of southern Ethiopia called uh, the um, Omo region. Um, and what we're doing is building public health surveys by uh, using machine learning to, uh, to look at satellite imagery that is actually taken every day and determine where uh, nomadic pastoralist settlements are. These are folks that move all the time. And so uh, we are building a system that will allow public health uh, uh, researchers to go into the field with a public health survey that we've designed from the satellite imagery. And in the field, while people are beginning to move their settlements and move this, uh, change their settlement patterns, we can, uh, we can reconfigure that public health survey on the fly at any given point during the survey and then send that new data to the, the um, researcher in the field. Uh, and then they can adjust their survey on the fly to new conditions on the ground. Um, I'll talk a little more about planet data probably a little later if y'all haven't heard of it before. Um, but uh, Shannon asked me today to talk about uh, data sources and, uh, and then jabber a bit and do some demonstrations of Google Earth Engine, which I think is uh, one of the more important um, Earth observation platforms and remote sensing platforms that's available. And it's actually available to anyone that has a Gmail account, which is kind of, uh, kind of astounding. So I'm gonna get started by sharing, let's see, I'm gonna share this desktop and then bring what I need down here. And I'm not sure I can tell. Can y'all see my, let's see. I can't yeah. see if, I, if I'm sharing. Am I sharing my screen? Do you see Earthworks there? Yes. yes. Yes, we do. All right, excellent. All right, so this is Earthworks. This is, uh, um, and I actually, I wanna point out, um, if you go to, um, this uh, guides.library, and I'll put this out on our uh, um, on the links uh, after the workshop. If you go to this link here, this is our libguide for uh, remote friendly resources, and we've dropped a bunch of data sources, uh, remote learning resources, and software resources in here. So anyone who's interested in what kind of things are available for uh, doing spatial data carpentry and geospatial data analysis, uh, um, from remote locations and most of it pretty, pretty um, laptop friendly. Um, you can take a look at these resources. All right, I'm gonna start with Earthworks and then I'll dive into uh, Google Earth Engine. Um, this is, Earthworks is actually our branded version of a, um, of a piece of software called uh, uh, GeoBlacklight. Um, GeoBlacklight is a search engine for geospatial data and it's, uh, and it's pretty specialized for, uh, for libraries in universities, um, museums, archives that, um, that have spatial data collections that collect data as a matter of, uh, of their business. Libraries um, at universities, we ob obviously do that. We collect spatial data for our researchers to use in their research and teaching. Um, and in, uh, historically, it's been really difficult to provide the ability for people to search for that data in a way that made sense uh, for geospatial data. So Earthworks does that. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the landing page is just a single search box landing page. Um, with some extra stuff down here, you can click on what are what we call uh, pre-facets, and these will just go to collections of types of data that you might be interested in. And then if you wanna search for data in a particular area, you can use the map uh, 
to zoom into an area and search in that particular bounding box. What I'm gonna do is just start by clicking search so we can talk a little bit about the interface and what's in here. Um, you'll notice we've got about 70,000 uh, data sets cataloged here in Earthworks. Um, that is not all Stanford data, and I'll just click here on the institution facet on the left side here uh, to show you that um, we index data from about 20 different institutions, including Princeton, Harvard, MIT, NYU, and so on. Um, and so this is a federated search. So when you search uh, Earthworks, you're also searching the data holdings of all of these institutions. Now, not all of those holdings are uh, publicly accessible. So if I go down here to access, you can see that um, about 47,000 of those data sets are public. So, so there are 40,000 data sets minus maybe a few of these unavailable that have broken server links right now um, or something's going on with them. Uh, but you've got access to almost 50,000 data layers in this platform that are publicly available that you can immediately download. So even though we've got restricted data in here, um, the, the public data uh, holdings are enough that this is a really good data source to, uh, to turn to when you're looking for uh, particular types of data. So let's just say that I'm looking for data about, and I always start with this, clowns, um, because it wakes people up and clowns are funny and um, uh, clown data is even funnier sometimes. Um, I have this data set uh, called Clowns of America International. You can see when I type in clowns, I get one hit because there's only one data set in Earthworks that has anything to do with clowns. So I'm just gonna click right into that um, uh, data sets return uh, link. And this brings me to the Clowns of America International Membership Point shapefile data set. And if I scroll down here to the bottom, you can see that not only do we have the, the metadata exposed in, um, in the page, we also expose the actual data itself. So I can zoom in here, I can see uh, the data points in this data set, um, and I can click on a data point. Let's see if I can get in there uh, and tight enough to get on a point. There we go. Uh, got a point, now I can see the attributes of this data set, so I can see if this data actually makes sense for uh, the research that I'm interested in doing. Once I've taken a, a look at the data and determined that the data works for me and, and is what I need um, for my work, then I can go over here on the side and I've got a number of options. I can download uh, the original shapefile. This is gonna be the shapefile that we actually put into the Stanford Digital Repository that will be in the original um, uh, projection and coordinate system of the original data set. And then here you can get derivatives. So if you're working in something like QGIS, or you're working on a web map, you might be interested in the GeoJSON. If, you're, uh, if you wanna use this in Google Earth, um, you can download a KMZ file and then a shape file in WGS84. If that's not the native coordinate system of the data set, you can get that here. We also, uh, if you click on this web services link, you'll see that we have links to what are called web map services and web feature services. Um, these are Geos, Open Geospatial Consortium uh, compliant services that'll allow you to ingest these data sets into a web-based platform like ArcGIS Online, uh, CardoDB, Mapbox, and, and other platforms if you're interested in doing that. And what we do is we make the web services on these data sets available to our users directly. And, and, and what that means is that the the web services that are driving this application where I can zoom in and look at my geometry and query the attributes and do things with the data, those are the same web services that we're exposing here for end users. So we do this for our, um, for our faculty and our researchers in case they wanna build a, uh, a, an interactive application, a web application based on the products of their research, they can put their research data into Earthworks we can expose it for data and, uh, for discovery. We can put DOIs and uh, give them a pearl of a persistent URL, but we can also expose these web services so that they can build uh, interactive web applications with their own data. So that's, um, that's Earthworks, uh, just a quick overview. Um, if you have a CardoDB account, you can open data sets directly in Cardo from a link here. Um, but that's the main thing I wanted to say about uh, Earthworks there. I wonder if there are any other data sources that I should have. There are a couple actually. This is a good one. 
um, this HDX right now, uh, this is a, a great source for humanitarian data. Um, this is the Humanitarian Data Exchange. And, uh, and right now they are um, making available the data that you see in the dashboard. They're actually helping aggregate all of that data and they're making that data available for download um, in their interface here. So you can download the uh, novel coronavirus cases data sets from HDX here. And they've even got the Johns Hopkins um, dashboard embedded here. And I didn't realize that we were over a million. That's, that's awful. Uh, but here are the data sets that are driving this dashboard, so you can come and grab those here, uh, as well as data sets on administrative boundaries, clinic locations, all kinds of other data sets um, for much of the developing world. HDX, um, uh, they focus on humanitarian data, so you're going to see a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, the Pacific, um, places like that data sets for those locations, places where there really isn't a commercial uh, motivation for mapping, so it's difficult to acquire uh, mapping data um, in, uh, when, when you need it for a humanitarian relief uh, uh, response. All right, um, the one other data set I want, let me just check in. Shannon, is there anybody with questions or anything so far in the chat? Not yet. I have put the links in for all of the sites that you've um, taken us to so far. So excellent. The chat. Um, and uh, I'm going to say one, I think one more site that I use quite a bit. Um, and that's obviously OpenStreetMap. I don't know if y'all have covered OpenStreetMap. This is a map of the world. It's crowdsourced. It's sort of like the wiki, uh, Wikipedia of maps. Um, this is another really great um, source for data in the developing world. Uh, we use uh, OpenStreetMap infrastructure for a lot of projects that I work on, particularly public health um, survey projects. So we're working with Facebook right now on a project to use machine learning to, to map building footprints and, uh, and roads in rural Haiti because we're building a service that delivers nighttime medications to rural Haitian villages via motorcycle taxi um, our problem is in these in these communes where we're working where we're launching this project um, there's no map of where people live there's no map of the roads there's no map of building footprints there's no addresses and so we're using a combination of open street map um, which is let me just uh, here open street map and uh, and something that Google uh, has developed or has been developed in cooperation with Google called um, uh, postcodes, plus codes. Um, these, are, uh, these are codes, if you actually, if you type in a, an address in, into Google Maps, um, let's just say uh, 397 Panama Mall. So if we go there um, and I get the card for that location, I should, let's see, no, it's going to want me to have an actual business. And so if we look for the address, why is it not showing up? Oh man, they don't have the plus code in here. Usually the plus code is here. I must be looking for it in the wrong place now. Um, you can type these plus codes into Google and they will go, uh, these are, what they are is identifiers for a three meter by three meter location on the surface of the earth. So we can actually tag buildings in Haiti with these plus codes and use those as proxies for a street address. Um, there's a really interesting project actually using plus codes in Navajo Nation to, uh, um, to give street addresses to Navajo um, citizens in the Navajo Nation who have not had uh, real street addresses, addressable addresses um, ever. Some of them live in incredibly rural uh, areas and plus codes are a way where they can have an actual addressable uh, um, uh, address uh, so they, they can get things like a, a driver's license and a bank account and just the basics that we take advantage uh, that we take for granted because we have addresses in some cases so those are two projects that's a project i'm using that on uh the hey, open Stace, street map to with. yeah a question um are those plus code codes similar or different from what three words 
They are different, and here's and there and there's a really important difference between what three words and plus codes, and that is what three words. Um, if you uh, if you have a three by three meter uh, cell that you have the what three words for the cell next to it, the three words for it have nothing to do with the the three words for the cell that you're in. And so what that means is what three words doesn't regionalize well, and that means it's it's not very well suited for planning logistics, which is exactly what we need it for. The nice thing about plus codes is that it has regionalization actually built in. It's baked into plus codes. So if you, you can either get a long plus code, which is an alphanumeric code that has all of the information in it, or you can get a short one that I think is about six or seven uh, alphanumeric characters plus the town and country that that plus code is in. So it looks like an address. Um, and in that that way, it's uh, you're able to regionalize it, and and the effect that have has is it actually gives people a hint about what they're looking at. And so we did an experiment with our um, uh, our project in Haiti. I I actually mailed a letter using the plus code for our um, headquarters in Gressier, um, using the plus code at, at Gressier, um, comma Haiti. Put that in the mail, and it took a long time, but it got there. Um, the, uh, the, whoever the delivery person was or the postmaster was, um, knew to Google that code to see what it was. And when they did, it brought up Google maps automatically. Um, which is what one thing that's kind of brilliant about plus codes is Google infrastructure knows what to do with them. And it will just take you straight to Google maps. If you type a plus code in. Nice. And I had one question that came in. Um, do you have any, before you go on to the imagery piece, any wildlife or ecology focused data sources that you recommend? Wildlife or ecology focused data sources, yes. So there is a map project called the Map of Life. It's a project at, at Yale and it is a, it's a map based project to aggregate all of the known biodiversity data in the world. And, and that includes everything that they're getting from people's shapefiles and research data to going and digitizing um, you know, maps of species, uh, ranges from publications from the 1920s and geo-referencing those and, and creating spatial data from those. So Map of Life is, is, uh, is a project I would look at and their data should be downloadable. Um, I think that was all the questions so far, so I'm going to mute myself and turn it back over to you. All right, so we're going to switch gears now um, because, so, so for that, Vector data, I think Earthworks, HDX, and, um, and OpenStreetMap, those are probably my three big go-to sources for vector data, points, lines, poly and polygons. Um, and then, of course, you know, the U.S. Census Bureau and places like that, but those are kind of obvious. Um, for raster imagery and for Earth observation data, there are lots and lots of sources, but there's, um, there's one in particular that's pretty... Um, pretty hard to beat, and that is Google Earth Engine. So I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight the Google Earth Engine data catalog first, and then I'm gonna back up and do a very quick intro um, to remote sensing uh, to see. Uh, so you guys have sort of a little bit of background on the fundamentals of what I'll be doing in the Earth Engine demo that I'll uh, that I'll do in just a few minutes. Um, so Google Earth Engine is a platform that makes Earth observation data available. Most of it is in raster format, pixel-based data. So these are data sets that are matrices of numeric values that represent the, uh, the value of something on the surface of the Earth, whether that's temperature, rainfall, uh, reflectance of electromagnetic energy, and so on, particulate matter, things like that. Um, generally, how we model that in a geographic information system is using raster data. Raster is, is best suited for things that vary continuously across the landscape. And that includes data like climate and weather data. You see here, um, you have all of this, uh, this data available in Google Earth Engine. Um, we'll, I'll give you an overview of how many data sets and how much data is in here later on as part of the presentation. I just want to give you an idea of what type of data is in here. Um, you've got for climate and surface temperature, you've got daily data sets, MODIS, 
um, Aster, things like that. Aster is going to be on 16 day, but Modus is daily. You've got the firm's data um, for uh, uh, fires and, and things of that sort uh, that's coming in uh, near real time. Weather data, you have a lot of uh, near real time uh, resources here. And one of the nice things about Google Earth Engine is that Google has such a, a a massive amount of compute power that uh, that they can actually they've partnered with the downlink sites for most of these data sources and they're actually pulling the data into their, their own infrastructure processing it and getting it pushed out faster than folks like NOAA and NASA and JPL and other organizations uh, that actually manage these data sets can get it into their own platforms. so this is um, Earth Engine is actually going to be one of the places where you can access this data some of these data sets first um, Landsat data, um, most of the 40-year the, um, corpus of Landsat is available in Google Earth Engine, and most of the demonstration that I'll, uh, that I'll do later on is based on Landsat imagery. You also have uh, available the um, European Space Agency's Sentinel project. Sentinel is uh, similar to Landsat, it has a higher um, spatial resolution, and, uh, but is harmonized with the Landsat 8 product um, so that you can use them interchangeably. Um, Sentinel also has a uh, Sentinel One is uh, is the lidar uh, is the radar prod, uh, product, um, so that, that's a three uh, dimensional um, synthet syn synthetic aperture radar product. So you can do actual three D uh, modeling with Sentinel data as well. This is and all of this data again is in the public domain. Modus is daily Im imagery of uh, for for weather cloud cover. Um, uh, uh, sea service, uh, things of that sort. Um, high resolution imagery, there's not a whole lot of high resolution imagery available in Earth Engine. You can work with it, you can bring your own in. So if you have uh, an education and re uh, research um, subscription to planet.com, you can import that data into Earth Engine and use all of the Earth Engine tools with that high resolution imagery, and that's very powerful. Um, but Earth Engine itself only contains public domain data. And so, uh, and so only public domain data uh, uh, represented in the high resolution imagery uh, space really is the National Agricultural Imagery Program from the USDA. Um, and that's in here, but it's only a snapshot of the continental US every couple of years. It's very high resolution. So if, if you're interested in things like archeology, span um, building footprints, things that stay put for a long time, uh, yeah, then, then that's of interest. Um, then you have terrain data, the CERTM data, digital elevation models. Um, I think there are some, uh, some other data sets like uh, the G-Topo, um, some lower resolution, as well as the World Wildlife Foundation's Hydro Sheds, which is a, a really great hydrology data set. Um, there are some land cover data sets that are available that are pre-packaged. These are data sets where each of the pixels represents what the type of data is on the, on the ground. And, um, but one of the really powerful things about Google Earth Engine is that you can access brand new satellite imagery and you can make these land cover data sets yourself. Um, one of the really powerful parts of uh, Google Earth Engine's capacity is the capacity to do longitudinal studies. So you can look at 40 years worth of Landsat imagery longitudinally and you can look at the changes in land cover very, very easily by applying land cover classification uh, algorithms to different snapshots of data uh, in time and then charting that out or exporting data sets for other applications like R. Um, uh, other types of classification and then of course there's night lights and other geophysical data uh, available with, within Earth Engine. The important thing to note about the Earth Engine catalog and, and what's so revolutionary about Earth Engine is is that you know when I started learning remote sensing, I would get one Landsat image and it would take me two or three days to pre-process that Landsat image, to stack and warp and do all of the things, pan sharpen, do all of the things that I needed to do to that Landsat image in order to make it possible uh, to begin even doing the analysis I was interested in. And what's great about Google Earth Engine is all of that's done. All you do is open up a browser and begin working. Um, uh, with the satellite imagery. So that said, um, I think some of you are not familiar. I, I got the idea that some of you are not super familiar with remote sensing and, and how we do remote sensing. 
And so I wanted to just speak uh, for a few minutes about how remote sensing analysis works, um, what it is we're doing when we take an image of the earth and we leverage um, non-visible layers of data and how we leverage that in, uh, in platforms like Google Earth Engine. Um, so before I get started, um, I guess I should see if, are there any questions in chat before we get going that we can knock out before we uh, go to this next section? All right, no. Okay, so, so far. this is a tiny introduction to remote sensing. It is a work in progress, so y'all are guinea pigs, um, and, uh, and hopefully it won't be um, terribly boring. Um, but uh, uh, digital images are what we work with when we're working with remote sensing data, and those are made of pixels. Um, if you've ever taken an image of something and then zoomed in too close to it on your computer screen, um, you'll have noticed that there were squares of color uh, that made up that image, and those are pixels. And those pixels are actually representations of numeric values. In the, in the case of a black and white image, they're the amount of, uh, of total reflected visible light. In the case of an image like this, where you've got color, um, they're the amount of red, green, and blue. And we'll talk more about that um, in just a second. Um, in fact, we'll talk about it now. Um, so electromagnetic energy is everywhere. It comes uh, what the the energy that we're talking about is coming from the sun. It's it's coming through the atmosphere. It's bouncing off of everything. Um, right now, my shirt is is reflecting very highly in the red part of the spectrum. Um, and if you look in this image that I've got on this slide, you'll see we've got a bunch of cars in this image. Um, we've got a red and a green and a blue car. If you look back in the background, there's also a white car. And off to the right there, you'll see that there's a black car as well. So we're gonna talk about how remote sensing works and how we leverage what's called the RGB model to do remote sensing in a geographic information system, at least visually. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're leveraging the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. We see in a very small part of that spectrum here in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, and, uh, um, this is uh, this is where if you take an image with your phone, uh, you're taking an image in the red, green, and blue part of the spectrum, and that's all within this visible band here, this visible uh, range of uh, electromagnetic energy. Now, satellites can see outside of that range, right? And so and so we can leverage that um, by sort uh, and we can cheat nature by sort of using this RGB model that we use um, on a regular basis with our cell phone to take photos. We can use it. To cheat nature so so let's say you're taking a photo of these of these uh, cars right what you're actually doing when you take a photo of those cars is cr creating three samples along the electromagnetic spectrum one in the red part and one in the blue part and one in the green part and your computer your phone or your computer your laptop or whatever computer you're using that happens to have a screen on it reassembles those three samples and you and mixes the amount of red green and blue between those to create these intermediary colors that we're used to seeing and using the rgb model with the number of levels of red and blue and green that you can have the number of values you can have millions of individual colors using this model and this is how digital images are created using this rgb model so this is what you're doing you're creating that red green and blue sample across the spectrum of that thing that you're taking an image of and this is the same thing that a satellite is doing um, in the red part of the spectrum you can see that the red car has very high values that means that it's showing up as very white as light color because its values in this black and white image are very high um, this is the red part uh, this is the red band if we shift to the green band we'll see that back here, the green car has very high values in the green part of the spectrum. If you look though, here in the red band, see back there that white car, very high red values. See the black car, very low red values. We switch, still very high uh, um, green values for the white car. The green car has naturally high values. And these two cars, you know, they have some green in them a little bit, maybe not this, uh, this red one so much. We switch to the blue, and again, we shift. Um, the blue car has very high values. Again, 
very low values for these darker cars, but the white car has very high values. And so we bring all that back together and we can see what we were looking at was a red car that was reflecting very highly in the red part of the spectrum, a green and a blue. And then this white car was very highly reflectant across the spectrum. And then these black cars were very highly absorbent across the spectrum. That's the phenomenon that, that we're working with here that we're leveraging. Now, naturally, what we're interested in doing is observing the Earth. So we do this with satellites, satellites like this one that are constantly orbiting the Earth. Um, we have a, a, a set of uh, um, government-owned satellites that observe the, uh, observe the Earth, like the ESA's uh, Sentinel program, uh, the Landsat program. But there are also uh, um, uh, an increasing number of commercial satellites, satellites like Digital Globe and Maxar. Um, the, uh, the planet scope satellites, uh, uh, new platforms that are uh, bringing on these micro satellite systems to do LIDAR and, uh, and hyperspectral imaging where you have hundreds of layers of spectral information instead of just the typical four to 10 layers of spectral information that you have with a platform like Landsat. And here's what we're doing. Um, the targets that we're interested in have what's called a spectral curve. And so here's that same electromagnetic spectrum, right, from the visible up into the um, near infrared and the middle infrared. And if we look at a target like soil, we'll see that as you move up through the spectrum, uh, soil changes the way it reflects electromagnetic energy. Um, if you look here at green vegetation, you can see that there are areas uh, along the spectrum where green vegetation reflects very highly particularly in the near infrared, and we do make a, a, great, a great deal of use of that. Um, but there are also windows where it reflects a, a, a much lower on the spectrum. And so we can use those differences to tease out targets from the satellite imagery that we're looking at. And then here you can see that water um, absorbs across the spectrum almost universally. So it's pretty easy to pull out of an image as well. Um, this is a little bit in the weeds, but these are atmospheric windows. These are windows through which the electromagnetic energy can, can, uh, can penetrate the atmosphere. And so these are the windows within which we image these, um, these particular targets. Um, and these are the Landsat 7 and 8 layers that you have uh, superimposed here. All right, so your phone produces three layers of spectral information. And let me look at my time. Oh, yeah, I am doing good. Um, the Landsat 7 uh, platform, for instance, has eight bands of spectral information. It starts in the, uh, in the blue. Um, it has the red, green, and blue, just like your camera produces. But it also has this near infrared, a shortwave infrared, a thermal infrared band, as well as another shortwave infrared band here. And then what's called a pan band. The pan band is all of the visible light that's reflected in one black and white in grayscale. And it's a much higher resolution image. You can see it's twice the resolution of any of the other and much more than that of the thermal. And so you can use this band actually to do what's called pan sharpening. You can actually make these bands even sharper than they are natively using this pan band. Um, so this is sort of conceptually what it looks like, where you have all of these bands of imagery that you're capturing from the Landsat uh, um, uh, uh, platform in, in this instance. And we can take that red, green, and blue model, and we can do things like take band four, which is the infrared, or band five, and we can drop it into this model um, where it doesn't necessarily belong in the red, green, and blue, but where it's useful for us to make things like healthy vegetation visible. This is an image here that you see where the infrared part of the spectrum has been dropped into the red band and healthy vegetation reflects very highly in the infrared. We saw that in that spectral curve. And so it naturally has very high values in the red. And so that's what you see. All these red areas are healthy vegetation there. All right, let's talk very quickly about resolution. Um, Landsat 8 spatial resolution is um, in the near infrared and the visible 30 meters. The pan is 15 meters. So um, if we're looking at this baseball field, a 30 meter pixel is basically the infield here. And then that 15 meter pixel is just uh, from the pitcher's mound there to the home base. 
And then in the thermal, we've got the whole baseball field is one pixel. And so that's what you're talking about in terms of pixel size on the ground um, in uh, Landsat in particular, when we're talking about this pixel resolution, which kind of looks like this. You've got a high resolution image on the, on the right. You've got a low, uh, the Landsat image on the left. And that's what we're working with. Um, which doesn't look great, right? We can't count cars and things like that. But what we can do is if we're interested in things like deforestation or, um, or urban heat, uh, heat islands, things of that sort, we can see those at this resolution. Those are uh, pretty straightforward to, to do, uh, to look at. All right, so great. Where's the download link for all this data so we can get started uh, working on it? Well, the problem with that is that we've got hundreds of these platforms and there really isn't a practical way anymore to download the data um, to work at the scales that most people are interested in. Um, in fact, until uh, about 10 years ago, only 4% of the Landsat archive had even been processed, had even been examined. Um, because we just didn't have the compute power to do it. We didn't have a way um, to get into that massive corpus of data in a meaningful way. Um, let's see, let's get, skip along here. This is, a, this is a, a, a big number, 40 petabytes of data. That's how much data is, is in Google Earth Engine. It's probably 50 by now, since I created the, this particular slide a few week, uh, months ago. Um, but it's constantly ingesting more and more data all the time. The value of Google Earth Engine comes when you think about what they're actually doing. What they're actually doing is taking that 40, 50 petabytes of data and co-locating it with compute power in their data centers. And that's the real magic of Google Earth Engine is they're co-locating that data with, uh, with Um, algorithmic primitives. There's a book on um, uh, Earth observation science and the opening, um, uh, the opening paper uh, hey, uh, was by Jim Gray, who, yeah. You froze for just yep, you a there? second. Yeah, you, you froze for just okay. a second. Um, so. Um, Let me double check that let me make sure my kids aren't uh, xboxing right now <laughs> give me uh, let me pause for a sec okay no problem all right i'm back sorry hey. about that. okay can you get off anything you're doing and go let me do the same just for like 15 20 more minutes <laughs> all right all right there we go new challenges We'll meet it's them. okay. I had to ask my um, other half to get off as get off of the um, the internet as well on my end. So, <laughs> all right, um, all right. So, so Jim Gray. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and and I think it's really relevant to the way that spatial data and um, is being managed and analyzed and distributed these days. Um, and Jim Gray made this observation. It, often it turns out to be more efficient to move the question than to move the data. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means that the data is just too darn big for the questions that we have now. You know, if we want to analyze uh, the 10 petabytes of Landsat imagery for the last 40 years that are in Google Earth Engine, we can't download that. That's, that's just, that's even a ridiculous proposition. And so what we need are platforms that take our questions and co-locate them with the data and the compute power. And that's exactly what Google Earth Engine does, um, is, is it co-locates the compute power with, uh, with the data that we're interested in. And here's what make, what's so powerful about that. This is an image um, of the coast of Borneo. Um, this is a land, typical Landsat image. You look at any Landsat image uh, on the coast of Borneo, and this is actually going to be a really good image uh, from, the, from the last 40 years of, uh, of Landsat on coastal Borneo. There's always clouds. Um, but the nice thing about clouds is they move, right? So these clouds won't be in the next Landsat image that is taken. And so that means that there will be parts of this image that will be 
clean pixels and parts will be clouds, but they'll be different parts. And so with Google Earth Engine, one of the first things they did um, that was actually the inspiration for, for Google Earth Engine, they were trying to get at clean images of, of the Earth, of areas of like this. And so they realized that they could take all of the images, the Landsat images that have been taken thus far and stack them up um, in, in time. So every 16 days, Landsat takes an, another image of this area and every other area on a uh, place on Earth. So if you stack those up, say for a whole year's worth of image, maybe 22 to 24 images, you can look down through that stack at every pixel location and you can find every clean pixel in the stack. And then you can assemble that into what they call a composite. And it's a pseudo image, it's not a real image of Borneo, but it's the best image that you can get. And so what you end up with is something like this. Now this is a pseudo image of Borneo uh, that was uh, assembled from about a year's worth of, of data. Um, but this can tell you a lot. This can allow you to do things like identify roads and highways and infrastructure and areas of deforestation. And when you combine these techniques with platforms like Planet, where you're imaging the Earth every day at three meter pixel resolution, this becomes really powerful. Now we've all seen the product of this. Every time you open up Google Maps, and look at Google Maps in the satellite view at the full globe um, view, you may not have noticed, but you don't see snow, you don't see clouds, and that's because what you're looking at is a composite. This is a digital globe and Landsat composite of the Earth over the last um, 20 years or so to give the best, cleanest image of the Earth um, that, can, that can be obtained. Now, once you do that, it actually becomes pretty trivial to then think about, okay, well, if I can do that for one year, what if I take all 40 years of Landsat imagery and I create each year as a, as a frame in a video? And so that's, we're looking at here, this is, a, this is actually seasonal change. Um, but if you, uh, if you look at 40 years worth of data, then you can begin to do things like this. You can look at riverine dynamics. Um, uh, like a, a, as if they're in a video. You can look at 40 years worth of, uh, of rivers changing course of urban growth in an area um, as if it's a video by simply creating these, these annual uh, composites and then using them as a frame in a video. You can look at deforestation in the same way. Um, this is more, uh, this was probably done uh, over the course of a couple of years um, using monthly or quarterly composites. All right, so that's some of the cool stuff that you can do in Google Earth Engine. Um, these are the uh, processing functions that uh, we have at our disposal on Earth Engine. And it's most of the basic stuff for working with raster and imagery data sets. So you can do band math, you can clip, um, you, can, uh, you can do kernels, uh, so that's a convolution where you, you create this little kernel algorithm that runs across the map and calculates something within a neighborhood. Um, you can map across things, you can aggregate data. Um, we'll, uh, we'll explore a lot of this um, in the demo itself. So with Earth Engine, we can grab an image. Actually, most of this stuff, we can get it. I'm going to go through this really fast, and then we're just going to dive into demo. We can get an image. We can apply an algorithm to that image. So maybe we'll do some band math, uh, some simple band math uh, to that image. Um, then we can take that and we can, we can say, filter that whole collection. Maybe I just want all of the images of a particular location that have less than 10% cloud cover within a date range. So I can grab all of those very easily in Earth Engine. And then once I do that, I can take all of those images and I can apply my algorithm to them. Um, and then I can flatten those. I can either reduce them into a single number so I can characterize that stack of images, or I can create a composite, or I can create a mosaic uh, across geographic space. Um, and again, what, what enables all of this is having those algorithmic primitives co-located with the, with the spatial data sets um, and the storage and compute power in Earth Engine. Um, Last couple of slides. This is uh, this is an example of what you can do with Earth Engine. This is a um, uh, a study of dynamics of forest dynamics over 12 years, where they took Landsat images for 12 years at 30 meter pixel resolution, and they looked at um, for every month uh, or every year, did that pixel location lose, gain, or maintain its forest cover? 
Um, and what they figured out was that uh, they took 12 years of data. They figured out that it would have taken about 300 years to calculate on a desktop computer. Um, and for Google Earth Engine, it took them four days to do the calculation. So that's, that's what we're aiming at, the, uh, um, at these calculations when we're using Earth Engine. Global Forest Watch has um, Earth Engine watching areas for deforestation. When a new image comes in, it runs its classification. If it sees new deforestation, it sends alerts to uh, people on the ground who are tasked with stopping that deforestation. And then here's another study where they were mapping global surface water over the course of 30 years in, in the same way that they were mapping the forest dynamics. Uh, a great way to do longitudinal studies. All right, let's jump right into Earth Engine. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into what's called the, um, uh, the code editor. There are two uh, interfaces to Earth Engine, the code editor and the um, uh, um, Explorer. The Explorer is a little uh, more graphic user interface, but it doesn't have nearly the amount of data in it that the code editor has. The code editor allows you to, uh, to bring any data sets that are in the Google Earth Engine catalog in. And, and it's just JavaScript. So one of the nice things I like about the, um, the code editor, and I will send you this, re, uh, this repo of my, um, of my example scripts. I'll send you that so y'all can play with these live. Um, but what's nice about Earth Engine's uh, code editor is you get immediate response. You get immediate gratification. So if I go in here and uh, this Hello Images is like the Hello World of Google Earth Engine. And what we're doing here is I've imported two image collections. I've got one that's the 30 meter uh, um, digital elevation model for the world. And I've got um, Matt Hansen's global forest change data. That's that data from that project that I mentioned at the end of the, um, of the uh, presentation. And if I, I, you'll notice that I've got this green text here is actually commented out. It's not gonna run right now because I've got it commented out. And I'm gonna go ahead and run this and what I've done now, and if you've ever worked with SRTM data and downloaded SRTM data, elevation data, um, you know that what I did uh, just now was pretty amazing. I'm looking at the 30 meter uh, resolution elevation data for the entire world um, in a browser in just a, a split second. Um, what I can do now is if I, if I want to take, for instance, let me turn on, this is that global forest uh, cover data set, and this is um, the loss layer. So these are areas of the world that lost forest over the 12 years of the study. And if I just want to mask those out so that I can see the elevation model underneath, then I can use that data set as a mask upon itself. And if I turn that off, now what I've got is this image of elevation and all of the areas of the world where uh, deforestation happened um, in that time period, that 12 years. All right, let's see. Computations with image. This is going a little bit further here. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to take that same SRTM data set. And you'll see that I'm, uh, I'm taking the elevation data here. I'm going to calculate slope. I'm going to use an algorithm called terrain.slope, and that's built into Earth Engine. I'm going to apply it to my SRTM data. You can see that data set's imported here. This is, these are the parameters of my visualization that I'm going to use uh, to bring it into the map down here. Um, if you've worked with raster data, then you might understand what a stretch is. And so this, these are the stretching values that I'm going to use. Uh, and then this is just where I add that data to, to the map. So I'll run this. I'm going to get two layers of data added to the map. You see this map add layer. It's going to add the SRTM data stretch to 0 to 3,000. But it's also going to add the slope data that's derived from that SRTM data um, down below. So you can see those layers have been calculated. And I can just come right on in here. Um, I'll zoom into the Bay Area because I'm familiar with it. And that will recalculate as I zoom around. It also uh, recalculates at different zoom levels. So you can see as I zoom in, it's going to recalculate those uh, slope values on the fly. Now that's what it's doing in the browser for me right now. I can get that data out and I can tell it exactly what resolution I want that data to be in. So if I want to calculate these slope values at 30 meter resolution, I can tell it to do that and I can get that data out of it pretty easily. 
Um, let's see. Let's go to uh, filtering an image collection because I think we want to move along. Yeah, I got five minutes left. Any questions so far? Shannon, you got anything in the chat for me? Yes. Yeah, so um, I have a couple of them. And one of them is because uh, some people are sending me private things. Um, so we jumped over into Google Earth Engine, and um, I actually put a note out to everyone said, hey, after this demo, um, Stace is going to talk to us about how to access Google Earth Engine and kind yep. of which account you should use. So I'm going to kind of put a pin in that. And then also, if folks don't know how, uh, don't know uh, JavaScript, so you're going to share your scripts with us um, after Yes, this. and training materials that are really well written. Okay. Um, so I figured that was coming, but I wanted to go ahead, since you were asking for questions, just yeah. so that people yeah. are Ooh, yeah. I don't expect anyone to remember any of this. If I get each of you to go, oh, that's cool, um, at one point in this demonstration, then I've done my job, I think, and then I'll provide you with all of these scripts, and you can go and play and do exactly what I'm doing, simply by loading these scripts, and uh, if, I, if I load this one up, I think, let me find one that's got things commented out. This one's got comment, commented out. So this, you'll see this little asterisk and, and, uh, and hash mark here. Those are the comments for a, a block of code. If you just delete those, then that code can run fully. And that's how my sample scripts uh, work. I've got part of it commented out. So you run it that first way and see what happens. And then you uncomment the code and run it again and see what the new thing that happens is. And that's, that's in my tutorial, so you don't really have to worry about it. All right, so let's um, load and filter an image collection. This is pretty straightforward, but this is really where the power of, of Earth Engine begins to become clear. Um, here I've got the Landsat 8 collection that I've imported, and I've declared it as a variable called filtered. Um, I'm, la I'm filtering Landsat by date using the filter date function, and the dates that I'm filtering to are between 7-1 and 7-31 of 2017. So July of 2017 is what I'm going and getting, and then I'm gonna add all of those images to the map. So if I run that, that should bring in um, any Landsat images taken during the month of July 2017. You'll see all of the tiles. You'll see the edges of the images. You'll see some areas maybe where images weren't taken and so on. As I zoom out, we'll get more images, but I'm calling all of those images all at once, right? right now into the browser and I can do things with them. You'll see some of them have cloud cover and so on. They were taken at different times, so they have different cloud cover. There's still a lot to be done, but this is incredibly powerful already. I've, I've just faceted down to a single month of imagery. So if I wanna reduce that image collection, let's see if I play around with the bands a little bit. So here I'm doing the same thing. I'm filtering to, uh, to the July um, and and I'm creating a true color visualization, and I'm gonna add that, and then here I'm creating an infrared visualization, which is gonna give me that red image you saw earlier with the vegetation, and I can simply run those and add those. They'll take a little longer because I'm calculating a little more now. Probably if I zoom into an area, it won't take as much firepower. There we go, it's starting to come in now. So there's my true color stretch. So the, the image looks a little better. Um, and I'm gonna turn that off uh, in preference to my false color. And here you can see that infrared layer coming in where you can see healthy vegetation, things like that. Now, maybe what we wanna do is actually create one of those median composites, those composite images like we saw in the, in the slide uh, presentation that Google makes to get a clean image. So that's what we're doing here. Same, uh, uh, same technique, we're gonna filter this time for a whole year of Landsat imagery. So this is a lot of imagery that we're take, taking and putting in a bucket and then applying algorithms to on the fly in a browser. We're gonna create a true color visualization for that, but then we're gonna compute here, what we're doing is we're uh, taking that entire stack of images, that whole collection, and for every band, we're going to find the median pixel value in that stack of images for each band, and we're going to create a pseudo image from that, and that's going to be our composite image, 
And then that image is going to come in as a true color. And so if I run that, what we'll see is the difference between these two types of images. Here you see the raw images coming in with the clouds. And what happens is when you take the median pixel value, it tends to prefer uh, uh, pixel values that don't have that white value, right? Those very high reflectance values. It tends to like um, the reflectance values that are closer to the norm, not the ones that are affected by clouds or snow cover, which makes them much higher across the spectrum. And so you see it does a pretty good job of taking out those clouds. <clears throat> if I zoom in again and let it load again, you'll see the cloud image, and then you'll see, uh, you'll see the image with uh, the median value, just taking the median value and turning that into an image there as well. Now, what we can do with that over time, if we combine that and I've got just, I've got zero minutes left, I think. Yes, I've got negative, sorry about that. But I see I haven't lost everybody. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one more thing. And that's this NDVI. So normalized difference vegetation index is a way to take the red and the infrared band in a satellite image and create a data layer that gives you a measure of relative vegetation health. It's what we use as a proxy for relative vegetation health. And so here I'm taking my Landsat 8 collection and I'm filtering it. And what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm actually running the normalized different function. So there's a function that will calculate this NDVI built into um, Google Earth Engine. I'm telling it for this image collection what the red and the infrared bands are and what name to call it. And then I'm gonna have it insert that into a composite image um, and go and grab uh, the greenest pixel. So it's gonna find the greenest pixel it can from every one of these images after it's uh, inserted the NDVI layer into each image set. So, and what that's gonna do is instead of taking the median uh, uh, pixel value, it's gonna measure the greenness pixel value value, that, that high um, sort of uh, uh, photosynthesis index. And, and when we map that longitudinally across the year, you can see these are the, the values um, within our area of interest. And I should probably show you, we've got this, uh, we can also handle geometries in Earth Engine. So here, uh, what I'm doing is I've got a point as a, as a region of interest. And what I'm doing is I'm getting the pixel value through time, the NDVI pixel value of that point right there and plotting it here in this chart. Um, and again, the value, the power of this is that I've taken thousands of satellite images and aggregated them together, created a composite, and then, and, and then run a function over it, that NDVI function, and then sampled the values across that function through time in what? it probably took three seconds for that script to run in the browser. Um, which if you're, if you're old school like me and you spent years working in, in Envy or uh, Dreesy or even uh, um, uh, Esri's art map doing satellite imagery analysis, you know how revolutionary it is to be able to just open up a browser window and begin working. All right, so last thing, Shannon mentioned I would talk about how you get into Google Earth Engine, and that is actually super easy. Um, so you're just gonna Google Google Earth Engine, which is gonna take you to the main page. And to sign up, you go right here to the sign up page. It's super easy. All you need is a Gmail account, um, and uh, you just fill out the short for form. Uh, what would you like to accomplish with Earth Engine? If I were you, I would just put that I'm a student taking a GIS and remote sensing class and I'm interested in using Earth Engine for remote sensing projects. Um, the, uh, the sign up I think now is instantaneous except for a few countries. So if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if you're from Iran or a couple of other uh, export control countries, you'll probably have to wait to have your, um, uh, your uh, account approved, but otherwise it's going to be instantaneous. Once you're in there, I see a question in the chat. Maybe you want to tell me what that one is while I'm you there, Shannon. Oops, I unmuted somebody yeah. instead of myself. Um, uh, keep running with this part, and I will get to that question because it'll pop okay. back over into the code viewer. All right, good deal. 
Um, all right, so also from the main page in Google Earth Engine, if you go to platform and documentation, there's this actually really incredible set of documents for Earth Engine. You're gonna land on the guides, which are great. And the guides have the machine learning stuff at the top because that's what everybody is interested in. Um, that's actually not, not a bad thing because if you go into these, you're gonna find that there are some, um, uh, there are some collab uh, um, Python notebooks that you can play around with and just begin playing with this immediately. Um, but what I would do is go straight to EDU. And if you're interested in learning the basics of remote sensing, but learning them through Earth Engine, there's a set of remote sensing labs uh, here that are done in Earth Engine, which provides some really great materials. But if you look up here, this is under EDU, and then you go to training resources. The workshop that I've been um, doing this, this afternoon is actually right here. Um, so the slides, most of the lecture slides, actually more slides than I use today. The beginning workshop, which has, uh, if you click on this beginning workshop link, it's going to take you to uh, a document that has uh, the instructor notes for every one of these scripts that I just went through and the ones that I didn't go through. And this is where you should start. And, uh, and the way you load these scripts is if you look in this document, you'll see Uh, there's a, it's going to open up the Earth Engine code editor and it'll load that repository in from the side automatically. Oh, uh, but my internet connect table. All right, at that point, I should probably open it up for questions, comments, anything like that. So um, you're breaking up just a little bit and I just want to let you know that. All right. Um, and, but one of the questions was, um, after you run the analysis, like um, the analysis that you ran, like in, in, the, in DVI or something like that in Google Earth Engine, what do you export as a result if you're doing research or if you're, you know? Excellent question. So the answer to that is if I go back to the platform and the code editor here is you can export a number of things. You can export to a table. Uh, you can export to charts. You can export, um, if you look here, uh, there is a, a sample script for exporting to raster. Um, so if what you're creating is a derivative raster data set, a classification, things like that, this sample script tells you both how to export the data or export a much smaller file size visualization. So if all you want is the false color 432 image, um, then you can do that as a visualization. If you actually want the reflectance data or the resulting data from whatever it was that you calculated, this is how you do that. So there are scripts in here that, that explain how to export the data from Earth Engine. And you mentioned earlier that there's the code view of um, code Earth Engine and then there's sort of the plain Earth Engine. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, I can bounce out to that as well. So if I go here to Explorer instead of Code Editor, one thing that's a little wonky about my, uh, my Explorer is I don't seem to have access to all the data on this account, but if I switch to my Stanford account, it works, which is weird to me. Let me get my phone. See, we're not the only ones using demo fo duo folks. Oh no. <laughs> no. We're we're on it. It's serious. You wouldn't you believe suggest me. oh go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, do you suggest that they use their um, their Gmail account or their email accounts that are William and Mary to sign up or do you suggest their Gmail accounts? Um, All right, so that's totally up to them, but here's the difference. So your William and Mary accounts will be tied to your G Suite for EDU accounts, and you will lose, I don't know, well, at Stanford, we have G Suite for EDU as well, but students lose access to that email address when they leave Stanford. And so what will happen is you'll lose access to your Google Earth Engine account. You can just create a new one, um, but you'll use, lose access to any scripts or anything like that that, that are locked into that, um, that account that's tied to your credentials at William & Mary. So what I would do is I would create an account with my personal Gmail so you just have it forever. And it doesn't matter. Um, Earth Engine doesn't care either way um, about that. 
And you're signing into these two different ones, um, the code and the kind of normal um, Google Earth Engine, kind of the Google Earth Engine, I like to call it light, the Explorer. Yep. Um, is there a reason why you use two different accounts with those? Um, because something's broken about one of my accounts right now, and I need to get with the, the developers to figure out why my normal Gmail account doesn't access um, the Explorer uh, when I can get into the code editor just fine. But my Stanford account seems to work with Explorer just fine. So let's see if we can get in here. And I'll show you the, the Explorer because it's kind of nice to have. You know, one of the nice things about everybody being under quarantine is nobody's got anywhere to go. So if you go over a little on, <laughs> on, on these workshops, it's actually okay. All right, so now when I click, I'm signed in as my Stanford account, I can go get that percentile composite. So this is a composite that's pre-made in the Explorer. This is that same thing. This is um, uh, the Landsat 7 for the year 2014. And if I zoom in here, it's recalculating that composite on the fly. And what's nice about the Explorer interface is that I can go in here to the visualization and I can see these bands. So, you know, we looked at what bands Landsat has and uh, we saw that band four is infrared, band three is red, and band two is green. And if I change the RGB bands there and apply that, then you'll see that false color infrared come in. So you can play around with this stuff really quickly here in the code editor. What's also really nice is that if I save this and then come back into it and click this download button, um, I can actually download this viewport. And if I want the GeoTIFF, I want all the bands, I want the native projection, and I want it at the native resolution. If I click download, what I'm going to get, um, oh, that, that might be too big, actually. So if I come in here to the city, if I want this Landsat image, And it's prepping that it bounced me out and it's gonna now i'm downloading that image so if i go here i should have a landsat image in here um all of, these are all the different bands of the landsat image from that particular view so the the explorer actually makes it pretty easy to do things like downloading landsat or um, srtm oh it used to be in here is it not in here now See, something's going on, there it is, um, with the uh, Explorer. I think it's getting kind of breaky. Um, but Shannon, you will be somebody familiar with the pain of downloading certain, mm -hmm. uh, certain tiles. Yes. Um, it is no longer necessary. Here, I can, I can zoom out to my area of interest, and then I can go right here to... Um, the download link for this certum and I can grab it at 30 meter pixel resolution for the viewport and uh, that one's too big so if you want it that big you're gonna have to go to the code editor you should be able to download it but it's given me problems at that resolution but for those of you who haven't taken a remote sensing class and feel free those of you who have taken a remote sensing class um, one of the painful parts of this is that you um, is the download of data and the processing of data and this is the um this to me is imagine me bouncing in my chair um you know just getting so excited because it's so much smoother uh, because you're you're leveraging all of those google servers rather than the processor of the computer that you're in um you know that you're that you have you're sitting in front of not only that, the pre-processing, I mean, that was the thing that was always so awful. It was, you know, before I ever did any remote sensing analysis, I spent six months learning to pre-process data, data, mm -hmm. data, and that's all done. In Earth Engine, you just, and one thing I like, even if you're not a programmer, Earth Engine is actually a really good platform to learn programming because it's immediate gratification it's a sandbox so the code either breaks or it works and it gives you feedback on what's what you've broken um so it's a very you know uh it's it's a satisfying way to learn to do uh coding for for research and uh and this type of analysis um so i would suggest not going into the explorer 
but going straight into code editor and learning to code there because it's super easy. And Stace, I have a question for you. Um, you were showing us the training materials. Is that also where your scripts are? Um, the script, so the scripts that I use are the same scripts that are in that training materials doc document. You just click on the bit.ly and it will load up. You'll, you'll log, it'll, what it will do is it will bounce you to the code editor. And if you're not already logged in, it'll prompt you to log in and then it'll bring those scripts into your repository and they'll be there forever once they're there. Okay. Just double checking that. I know that you were showing, but I'm making sure that that everybody knows where that is. Any other, I just put in a really large chat um, piece to answer a question of lose, whether or not they lose their access to their G Suite. Um, any other questions or any comments from um, anyone, please feel free to mute um, if you'd like to ask a question or if you just want to comment on how quickly, um, how quickly it, the processing is compared to what you had in your own remote sensing experiences. See, I want you know. I mean, or I'll, also listen, any questions. I will let about you guys go right now, or I will show you Planet.com. What's it going to be? If everybody unmutes and then remutes right now, I'll know. Uh, so yeah, Planet. let's do Planet.com, and then also I took remote sensing at William and Mary, and this was an awesome demo, and I'm so glad I did this. Now. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with Tate. I mean, in that sense, you just did in five minutes what uh, it took me about five weeks to do in the room yeah. in class. So, uh, you know, when when David Tao, so we did the first summit for Google Earth Engine at, at Yale when I was there. We hosted it. And when David Tao just brought up in a browser an entire year of Landsat imagery and did a false color 432 composite in a browser in seconds, I was just like, you know, most of the folks in the in the summit were students who hadn't really done remote sensing. I had been doing remote sensing for about 15 years at that point, and it just melted my face off to see how fast that could happen. So, all right, so let's bounce out to Planet. Um, what you should know about Planet.com is this. It's the same type of imagery that we're talking about where it's pixel-based with bands of image. Uh, it's got bands of spectral image uh, um, information. Um, the planet scope imagery is just um, red, green, blue, and an infrared band. But the real power of planet is that they image the Earth once a day. Let's see if my subscription is still up and active. Um, you can get uh, an education and research uh, subscription to planet um, for free. You'll get ten, uh, access to 10,000 square kilometers of imagery per month. And they, you know, like I said, they image the earth once a day. So what does that mean? Um, I usually zoom into this area where, where I work. So I'm going to do that. And let's see, where is Kabish, Kabish, Kabish. It always hides from me. Um, let's see. There we go, but that is the wrong kibish. So there's another kibish right over here. And um, Stace, yeah, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Let's see. And I'm in this one. Can you see it now? Uh, it's loading. Okay. So you might want to just back up a little bit of, you went to planet.com. I've put that into the chat. All right, planet.com. You can get an education and research uh, um, uh, subscription to this service and this imagery. So if I create, uh, I'll just create an area of interest um, here. And what I've just done is I've searched planet.com and these are all of the uh, images that they have. So you can see they've got an image. Oh, that's today. So this is the image from today, which was probably actually yesterday for us. Um, the day before, before, before. So we're getting these images once a day here. Um, and uh, if I go here, I can see each of the individual images that this is made, at, made of. 
one of the nice things is if I go in here, I should be able to see in the monthly base maps. So if I clear my area of interest, those composites that we were looking at in Google Earth Engine, the ones that are built from you know a, a year's worth of imagery, this is a composite built with a month's worth of imagery, and that's much more useful, especially at three meter pixel resolution. So with this kind of imagery, you can actually do things like crop monitoring. You can monitor deforestation. You can see things, um, you know, temporally that you couldn't see otherwise. So if I if I look at this area, let's see what it looked like in October of two years ago. And so these are those composite images. So you can actually look at change through time in this way. So again, that's Planet. Um, they, they have an API that is also, uh, that's associated with, uh, with these um, data products. So let me just create an AOI so I can jump out into that. And then if we jump here, then we can go to the docs and this tells you how to use their, their API to, uh, to leverage the data. Probably the easiest way to leverage planet data is uh, in, a, in a Python notebook using what's called the orders API. And the orders API allows you to do things like clip an area of interest, um, create a composite from a particular range of dates, uh, a, a couple of other sort of data carpentry things for raster data, and then either download or deliver that uh, that final um, uh, image that you've created to an Amazon S3 bucket, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and they are adding Google Earth Engine as a destination delivery point, um, I think, this month. So within the next month, you'll be able to take your free 10,000 square kilometer account with, uh, with Planet, create you know, say a weekly composite and deliver it directly to Google Earth Engine, or just grab the raw images and put those straight into Earth Engine and work there. And with that, I, I, I hate to, to wear you guys out. I can jabber about this stuff until your ears bleed. Um, so just, you know, for the record, if you don't make me stop, I might not. I feel like we should invite you back for a uh, <laughs> for a, a notebooks overview. Um, yeah, I've actually done that um, in class either, and it's interesting because I'm getting some private messages um, about you know the fact that they that folks are realizing how important coding can be. Um, and Absolutely, the, yep. the Jupyter notebooks and the Python, you know, all of the different types of notebooks that are out there, and they, I. I just saw that yesterday on ArcGIS Online, they released their ArcGIS Online notebooks. Yep. Um, I haven't had a chance to play around with it, but those are- I haven't either, but that that's exciting. Notebooks, uh, notebooks and sandboxes like Google Earth Engine's code editor have made programming accessible to anyone. Um, and in a way that's actually kind of, kind of pleasant and fun to use. I mean, code editor's fun because you get immediate response. Um, and it's very satisfying, but you're right. Uh, programming is absolutely essential. I would, I would pick between either learning to program in R or learning to program in Python. Those are the two big ones. If you want to do remote, uh, remote sensing and machine learning stuff, learn Python. Yeah. Um, can you explain really quickly to those who are, I've got a range of people on this, uh, video. Who've, who've come into our, our room today and they there are some some who would know what a notebook is and some who don't um, yeah. but, you know some of the old timers who remember something with spiral being a notebook or right all right so so a notebook is um, is this new device uh, that is designed it's like a cross between let's say you took a, a programming uh, application you know where you write code and then you run it and the thing happens right and you combine that with a word processor um, and so a notebook is is a document that has both text and images so you can have explanatory material as well as code blocks that will actually run in the document um, and what's what's nice about that is it, it makes it makes research and teaching with code so much easier because you can co-locate the code and the explanatory text I can say Here's what I'm going to do. 
here's what the code's doing, here's what the data is doing, and then I can put the code in and you can just click a run button and see it run. And then you can change the values and see it run in a different way in the notebook. That's what's really nice about it. I would say two things about notebooks. What's one thing that's really nice about Esri uh, ArcGIS Pro is that you get notebooks installed automatically with ArcGIS Pro, I think since version 2.3, uh, maybe it was 2.4. And um, Google Colabs is a free notebook infrastructure. And if you have a G Suite for EDU, then you have access to Google Col Colabs and Colabs is just Google's version of the Python notebook thing. It, it works exactly the same as everyone else's. But the beautiful thing about Colabs is that you get a free GPU with it. So if you want to play around with machine learning, Colabs is the one to go to because you're going to get a GPU that's going to make that much, much uh, faster. And one of, our, one of our folks said, can you share a notebook? I haven't used it before and I'm curious what they look like. Sure. Actually, if you go to, um, I, I'll, I'll send some links to you. I'll, I'll send you an email with links to send to everyone and they'll include a notebook. Um, but actually, let me, let me share my screen one more time. And everybody do me a favor, put your name into the, um, the Zoom chat so that I know who's here so that I can send forward the email. So if you go to the Planet Developer Resource Center, they actually have a great set of Planet Notebooks and you can go to GitHub and with your free ENR account, you can begin playing with the Planet Notebooks. And so if I go in here and let's see, I go to Colabs. I actually, no, I don't think I have one open. So I think it's actually called Colab. There we go. All right, so I'm going to go into Google Colab, and this is the welcome here. And so you can you can see that you can embed all kinds of stuff in a Colab, video content, text content. But here's a code block. And so if I run that code block, um, oh, I'm not signed in. Well, that code block will run, and I'll get the uh, result right down here. And you can see that the code block built in here. Um, let me sign in so I can actually load a collab and what's kind of cool is that so the planet collabs where are they um, I've lost I think I went to this page from there um, but if I go here to file and open notebook you can actually go to github I think that's the URL for the planet ones. Yep, there we go. So if I open up planets uh, notebook for um, basics of data, let's see, let's do the ordering API. Uh, we'll just open any of them, it doesn't really matter. So I can open that directly from their GitHub in Colabs and now I've got it open in my Google Docs. And here, once I start running, I can connect to um, a hosted runtime that is a GPU. So if I go here and uh, let's see, change runtime type, it should be here. I should be able to set it to a GPU. And so now if I'm doing machine learning stuff, it's gonna perform much, much better um, and this is this is a Google Colab here. Um, we've got the the overview, sort of the structure that you're used to seeing, say in a Google Doc, and uh, and then you can begin to run um, run these things. So here we're running some numbers, and then we've defined a function there, and we're going to map that. And so the idea is just that you can embed Python code into a document that you also have sort of the explanatory text in. It's like, it's like a programming document with better, with better comments, basically. It's kind of a visualization of the comments. And yeah. 
if yeah, you're doing it's, it, it's much easier to share. And and there's and there's lot you know, like I said, now there's lots of great infrastructure where you can leverage this thing. It used to be that you have to you had to run like you know a Docker image to get Jupyter notebooks going on your own machine, but that's not the case anymore. Um, you know, you can just spin up Google Colabs for free and use it there. Right, and and you can embed. For those of you who are not familiar with notebooks and with the, the programming piece, the beautiful thing is, is that you can pull in um, from some of the existing, like the Python, um, Python library and other things, um, you can pull those in and embed maps and run analysis inside the notebook yep. and then you can share your notebook with all of its coding in it. You can share that out to other people. Uh, yep. So that's a really powerful piece. If you are interested in it, I think I have some videos that I purchased from last year's user conference um, that I can embed in our inside of our Blackboard and make them available to our William and Mary folks. Um, for those of you who are William and Mary faculty staff, I have ways I can get that to you as well. Um, and so that if you want to learn more, I have resources on this, especially if it's something that you're sitting at home and you're like, Ooh, I really want to know more. This is something professional development wise you want to, to kind of think about and, and embed. Um, are there any other questions um, before we wrap up? Because I know that we've, we've gone over, but we also, you know, it's one of those we get experts in and, and I appreciate the fact that everybody's time um, that you're sitting here, but I also appreciate that Stace is willing to, to give us his time. So any last questions? Does everybody just want if to anyone if anyone does have any other questions specifically for me uh, uh, um, then I am perfectly happy to have folks get in touch with me directly um, okay. please feel free uh, Shannon will uh, will send out an email with my contact information uh, as well as a bunch of links that we've mentioned here and uh, and please do uh, get in touch with me if you have questions for me specifically yeah. So everybody's saying thank you in the chat. So Stace, I, I really do appreciate it. And um, yeah. be, be well and tell your boys you can they can get back onto the uh, game console. All right, I hope this went well. I hope the demo part wasn't too scatterbrained. Um, and uh, I, I feel like it went well. And it seemed like from some of the comments that folks were, uh, were happy with it. So, um, so thank you for letting me use you as guinea pigs for, for my class that's coming up next, uh, next Friday. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you much. Thank All right. You. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Stace.